Thank you. So yeah, I will give this uh, session on the PBT VPVB assessment. So the yeah PBT VPVB assessment. So um, this assessment was already included in the former guideline, and also now it still needed to be assessed. So just a short recap on what PBT and VPVB is. So PBT stands for persistent bioaccumulative and toxic, and VPVB stands for, stands for very persistent and very bioaccumulative. And these um, assessments are basically assessments of hazard properties that these compounds have. So I will show that later on, but you have the different, you have the risk assessment and the hazard assessment, and the PBT VPVB assessment is part of the hazard assessment. And these uh, cre these properties can be assigned to to compounds based on uh, yeah based on their properties. So what is P? What is B? And what is T? So P stand again stands for persistence, and which basically means that compounds stay for a very long time in the environment. So they, for example, don't degrade. This makes them very long-lasting in the environment. The B stands for bioaccumulative. So they these compounds are being taken up by organisms and are also accumulating these organisms. And T stands for toxic. So this means that they have at first effects effect at first effects on organisms and often already at low concentrations. So the hazard assessment is separate from the risk assessment. So in the era you always do and a hazard assessment and a risk assessment. And basically why are we doing this or why are we doing this separately from the risk assessment? Well the reason for that is that the intrinsic properties of these compounds make makes them unwanted in the environment, even at very, very low concentrations. So if you look at the former guidance, there was one sentence uh, about the screening of persistence, uh, bioaccumulation and toxicity. And in the new guidance, we made it a bit more elaborate. So in the new guidance, we have also have the two steps. So the first step is a screening assessment. Uh, and you, in the screening assessment, you check whether an actual assessment is needed. So step one is the screening, step two is the actual assessment. And just as for the risk assessment, we also made this figure with different steps that you will have to take in the screening to see whether an actual assessment is needed. So interestingly, um, there are multiple steps, so I think in total four steps uh, and questions that you can answer. And if you compare the steps of the PBT VPVB screening assessment with the risk assessment, you might notice that the questions are similar. So uh, probably also an assessment in assessment if they can answer if the answers on the risk assessment for these questions can be the same as for the PBT VPVB uh, assessment. Um, so you can actually, yeah answer these questions similar to simultaneously, and I will mainly focus on the differences. So also for the other, the next question, so one question one, two, and three, they are actually similar as the risk assessment, and act, the only difference is from question four and onwards. And for the PBT, VPVB screening assessment, you assess, for example, whether they're uh, in screening assessment, whether they easily degrade or whether already a uh, PBT, VPVB assessment is available, so perhaps it's nice to go back a bit. So in question uh, two, you already can assess whether already an assessment has been done. So for example, whether medicine is also available uh, as an industrial chemical and already a PBT, VPVB assessment is available, you could also use that assessment and you don't need to do another assessment because it's already been assessed in a different uh, regulatory framework. But the main difference between the Assessment is from question four onwards, and in question four, in the screening assessment, you ask the question whether or not the KOW of the compound is higher than 4.5. And in case that's the case for the compound, you have to do an actual PBT, VPVB assessment. And to let you know, this trigger is differently than the one that I uh, showed you earlier from the secondary poisoning assessment. So in secondary poisoning assessment, it was three, and here it's 4.5. Um, so the KOW trigger. So for step four, a KOW study is needed. Um, so you, you need it for this assessment as well as for the secondary poisoning assessment. And for and always, we need an experimental study for KOW. So for every active substance for which an error is required, we need an experimental study to decide whether the trigger is met or not. And normally, a test with three different pHs, which are all environmentally relevant, are needed. So often it's 
pH 5, pH 7, and pH 9 are, te are tested, and you will generate three different results. Um, the applicant can either choose to follow OCD 107 or OCD 123 to do the test. And formally, also, we accepted OCD 117 as an uh, experimental method to assess the KOW, but now we remove that one from the guideline. Uh, so that's differently from the former guideline. And the reason for that is that we consider the results of a 17 study only as a screening for, KO, for uh, KOW and not as an actual value. Um, so only a 107 and 133 tests are being accepted. And what you do is that the highest value of the results uh, that you get, so you get three different results and the highest value you need to use for the screening, which is similarly as for secondary poisoning. Um, so yeah, a KOW is actually the yeah uh, a, a value that you derive for neutral compounds. Um, but you could also have in, in many in many cases it is so that a pharmaceutical is an ionizable substance, and you should know that when you determine a KOW for an ionizable substance, you don't derive a KOW, but a so-called DOW, an octanol water distribution coefficient, and this value accounts for the ionized fraction of the active substance, and for the assessment, what we need is an actual, probably a KOW. So what we can do is, uh, because the KOW is often higher than the DOW, is that we can recalculate the DOW to KOW. And we so call that the ion corrected DOW. And there's a formula also given in the guideline, which helps you recalculate the DOW with some information on the pH and the pKa, which should be available to a KOW value. And this value can then be used to compare to the triggers. So in this case, the 4.5 value. Um, so in case you have a compound that has a KOW of higher than 4.5, you go to the actual assessment. And in the actual assessment, you assess both PBT and VPVB. So often we call this a PBT assessment, but basically you uh, assess two different Property, so both the combination of PBT and VPVB, and when you do when an actual assessment is needed, it's it's normally a sequen sequential assessment. So it's not that you for every uh, property you need data, and it's not that you generate all data simultaneously. You could of course do that, but often it's better to first assess one property, then the other, and then the other to avoid unnecessary testing. Um, Based on the available data, you might have a certain order. So we start with KOW trigger, and then the PBT, VPVB assessment is triggered. And for example, in some cases, uh, they start with assessing B. Uh, for example, if you also need to assess secondary poisoning, you can also, you already need a BCF value, and the BCF value is used to assess bioaccumulation. So it might be better to first assess that, because the classification of PBT and VPVB means that all properties need to be met. So in case a compound is not B, for example, it can never be PBT or VPVB anymore. Um, so it could be that you start with B, but, but normally what you often see in such assessments is that they start assessing P, then B, and then T. Um, what we know, because we, we always do a risk assessment and a hazard assessment, in case a phase two assessment, a risk assessment is already uh, being done, it means that so certain data is generated. Um, so in case of the phase two assessment for surface water, you already generate ecotoxicity data for aquatic organisms. And such data can also be used for the different, uh, for the assessment of toxicity. So um, uh, there is already, if risk assessment phase two is being assessed, data is generated, which you can also use for the PBT, VPVB assessment, which is very helpful. In case phase two is not, a risk assessment is not being triggered, it might be that all data needs to be generated for the PBT VPVB assessment itself. And on the right here, you see a table, um, which is also included in the guideline, and it says which triggers are to be met to classify a compound as P, B, T, or VPVB. Um, and there are different uh, criteria or situations applying. And for example, if you look at persistence, there are uh, there are five different situations which makes a compound persistent, and uh, it works that once if one situation applies, the compound the property is triggered. So, let's say for persistence you have A B C D E. If A B C D 
a C and D don't apply, but E do, does apply, then the compound is called uh, persistent. Um, so zooming a bit into the different uh, criteria, so persistence, so that's uh, looking whether or not or how long a compound stays in the environment. So there are different uh, situations applying to this criteria. And if we want to assess persistence, we need to have a DT50. DT so uh, a, a, uh, the degradation time to which 50% of the compound is de de uh, degraded. Um, in some cases, we know that the compound is uh, readily biodegradable. In case that uh, applies, then you don't need to assess the compound on persistence. It's automatically not P. But if you have a compound that's not readily biodegradable in a screening test, for example, the 301, then you might need to do the persistence test. And there are different options to do so. So there are three different uh, tests you can use, different simulation studies. There's OSD 307, 8, and 9 for different compartments. And it needs to be justified by the applicant which compartment they test. So it could be uh, reasonable to, for example, test in soils uh, because the compound has, a, uh, for example, very high KOC. KOC of, um, so the, they could justify why they want to use a certain compartment. Um, but in a PBT assessment, it is so that if, for example, a compound is tested in soil and we assess the results with the criteria and it does not uh, fulfill that criteria of the table, it may still be that it's persistent in, for example, sediment or in water. So um, every compartment should be tested unless it is justified that, for example, the compound doesn't end up in that environment or that it's not reasonable to, to test such a compartment. Um, some important considerations for the, per the persistence test. So if you see such simulation tests, there are some things you have to take into mind, um, which are also explained in the, the guideline, by the way. But um, one of the aspects that you always need to take into account is that all results of the degradation test need to be normalized to 12 degrees. So a test might also be, for example, be performed at 20 degrees, which is higher. Uh, and you would often expect uh, higher degradation rates at higher temperatures, but we normalize it to 12 degrees to make all the uh, results comparable. And the, in the guideline, there's also an equation, which is given above, is stated where you can recalculate the DT50 value. Another aspect which is important to take into account is that for DT50, and especially in water sediment tests, you want to have DT50 for the whole system. So if you have a water sediment test, the 308, a compound might degrade, stay in the water, but could also migrate to the sediment test. And you want a, to have a degradation time for the whole system. And sometimes what you see is that the degradation time is being calculated for one of the compartments, so water or sediment, but not for the whole system. Um, another important aspect uh, with such tests is are the non-extractable re residues. So that these are uh, residues that are, are bound to the ma matrix uh, and what to do with that. So there's been a lot of discussions about it over the past years and um, these residues, you might not find them anymore because they are bound to the matrix, but that doesn't mean that they are not degraded. You, you don't know because they, you can't extract them anymore. So what we do, in the, what you should do in these tests and in the calculation, if you calculate the DT50, you should consider these non-extractable residues as non-degraded, uh, unless they are irreversibly bound. So irreversibly bound means that they are really uh, connected to the to the matrix, so it's kind of a safe thing, but they could also be reversely bound so that they could, could come back. So unless there's no inf yeah, in, unless there's information provided that they are irreversibly bound, you should always consider these non-extractable residues as non-degraded. Also, the last aspect that I wanted to highlight is the DT50 values that are being calculated. So um, DT50 values are needed for the PBT assessment, but can also be needed for the terrestrial risk assessment. And what we do in the risk assessment, in the terrestrial risk assessment, uh, is that there we, in principle, use the geometric mean of the DT50 values. So if sufficient values are available, you always use the geometric mean of these values. So if you have four or three soil values, you, you do that. In case you have less values, you should always use the highest value. But in the PBT VPVB assessment, we always use the highest DT50 value because we want to be worst case. And there are many different soils. And you, it could be that in one soil type, the compound is 
persistent and in another one it's not, but you still consider it in that case worst case that the combat is persistent. Mm, some considerations on bioaccumulation and toxicity. So for bioaccumulation, we have a trigger value of uh, for the BCF of 2000 for uh, bioaccumulative and for very bioaccumulative a value higher than 5000. So before I already shown some information on the 305 study that you need to use to derive a BCF value. And I would uh, suggest you to go back to the slides of secondary poison assessment if you want to know more about that test and where, what you have to keep in mind when looking at such a test and the results. If we then look at toxicity, so there are multiple criteria for tox toxicity and um, the one being most relevant also for the, for the risk assessment in the era is, is number A, which focuses on the toxicity resul results in aquatic organisms, um, where there's a trigger value of uh, 0 0.01 milligrams per liter. And if, it, if the NOAC um, is lower than that, then the T, the toxicity property is triggered. And also for those information, more information on the test you can perform to assess toxicity on aquatic organisms, I would refer you to the risk assessment phase two surface water slides. Um, but interest, more interesting is perhaps the B and C criteria. And these criteria, which could also apply, are related to the uh, classification in within CLP, uh, the labeling and packaging regulation. So it could be, uh, for example, that a compound is considered persistent based on the degradation studies, bioaccumulative based on the BCF value, but not to toxic based on the aquatic organism studies. However, it could still be PBT because of criteria B or C, and B or C should always be checked within the classification in the COP regulation, whether or not a compound is classified there as, for example, carcinogenic or mutagenic, because all these properties also make a compound considered T within the PBT assessment. So pr primarily when P and B are being considered, but T not based on A, I would always suggest definitely to go to the COP uh, regulation, um, whether or not the compound is also regulated under there and whether such a property applies. So if we look at if we look at the guidance, um, if you look at the, uh, how to assess the PBT VP, VB properties, there aren't ma many major changes compared to the former guidance. However, there's many more explanation on how to do it, the table with properties. So a lot of information is included. Also the test guidelines for data are included and the important details which you should focus on. For example, uh, the normalization of temperature, which I just mentioned for, for assessing persistence, but also for the BCF value that you always have to normalize to 5% lipid content. Um, so important details are explained there to help you out. Um, what you know is that the PBT VPVB assessment is, is greatly in line with the assessment being done under REACH. So our uh, guidance is also focused on their uh, focus. Yeah, it's also based on the guidance in REACH. And if you want to know more, you can always go to uh, R11 uh, document of, of REACH, which goes into depth on the PBT VPVB assessment. And the newly version is published last December to have some more background information on studies, on data. So you can always go there if you want to know more about the assessment. And there's also a training video, which is currently not yet online, I think, but will become online on the assessment that you're doing here. Also for the PBT VPVB assessment, I already included some Q&A questions because I thought perhaps this might help. So one of the questions uh, that could pop up is, um, yeah, what's required for generics if the log KOW is higher than 4.5, but the pack surface water stays low, yeah, less than the trigger value and the assessment does not enter in phase two. So in the risk assessment, you don't have a phase two assessment, but based on the KOW, you have to do a PBT VPVB assessment. Should the applicant then conduct a full assessment, inclu including the required PBT uh, studies? Um, so the answer is actually yes. So irrespective of the risk assessment, the PBT VPVB screening and assessment need to be conducted. So if the log KOW trigger is uh, tr triggered, then a stepwise PBT uh, assessment needs to be done. However, similarly as which is explained yesterday for the air uh, for the risk assessment part, there might be cases where uh, studies don't need to be repeated again based on earlier assessments being 
uh, done by other uh, companies and which already have, for example, been considered satisfactory by the EU National Competent Authority. And when a compound is, for example, registered under uh, REACH, you could also use the PBT, VPVB assessment over there. So if they already did a full assessment for the compound, you could also use those results um, to conclude on the PBT, VPVB properties. Um, another question that might pop up is, may an applicant omit the studies and regard the compound as PBT, VPVB? So just state, okay, we don't, we won't, <laughs> don't want to do the studies and we just consider the compound PBT and VPVB. The answer is no. Um, the applicant has to provide any evidence that the compound is PBT, VPVB or not. Uh, and I mean, uh, there could be also some, um, uh, I mean, there could be some mitigation measures needed in the future and we just want reliable information on, on the properties. So they can't omit studies. Um, they however, instead of, generating own data, they of course can use reliable and relevant data from the open literature if available and assessed being reliable and relevant. This was my presentation. <laughs>